It had been a long day on Capitol Hill for Senator John Stennis. He was looking forward to getting home, putting his feet up, kicking back, and relaxing. And so as he pulled his car up in front of his house in Washington, D.C., he got out and headed for the door. And then it happened. Out of the darkness came two thugs. They robbed him right on his own front lawn, and then they shot him twice for no good reason. He'd already given them money, but they shot him for no reason. The news of the shooting spread all around, not just Washington, but around the nation. And if you remember this name, John Stennis, John Stennis had been the chairman of the Armed Forces Committee, which is a fairly high-ranking position. Well, for nearly seven hours, this man lay on the operating table at uh, uh, Walter Reed Hospital. In less than two hours after the shooting, uh, there was another politician that had just left the Capitol. He was in his car, he was in his limousine, heading for home, and when he heard the report of the shooting in the radio, and he immediately had the driver turn the car around and head to Walter Reed Hospital. And when he showed up there, as you might imagine, all pandemonium was breaking loose. Because here was a fairly notable person from the government who had been uh, shot was hanging on, uh, you know, just by a thread that was on a desk door. And so there were calls coming into the hospital, not just from all over the country, but from all over the world. And so this other politician that showed up spotted a telephone at a desk, and he sat down and began to take calls, began to return uh, calls for some of the people that were just well-wishers of, Pat, or of uh, Senator Stennis. This man sat there all through the night, until early morning. And as the sun was coming up, he stood up, he stretched, he put on his coat, and then he introduced himself to the, the nurse, to the receptionist that was coming in at 6 a.m. For, for duty, and he said, Hi, I'm Mark Hatfield. I'm happy to have helped out. And then Senator Hatfield walked out to his car and went home to get some sleep. Now, think about the story with me. The news media could not believe that a conservative Republican like Mark Hatfield would do something so kind for a liberal Democrat like uh, John Stennis. Most Republicans and Democrats, as you know, in this day and age, will not even speak to each other or tip the hat to one another. They don't have time of day for one another, let alone when they sit at a desk all night and do a fairly menial act to help out much less to end it off by saying, I'm glad to be able to help. Would you agree with me? This would be a rather rare occurrence in this day and age. And listen, not just because of the polarization between Republicans and Democrats, but also because in this day and age, everybody wants media coverage. You know what I mean? Everybody wants recognition for their good deeds. They want a pat on the back, they want a plaque on the wall in their honor. Seldom do public figures offer any act of grace without looking for fanfare, looking for some sort of reward for what they've done, not just in Washington, not just in Hollywood or on Wall Street, but even in, in mid-America. In fact, I would even venture to say sometimes in our own homes, we all want fanfare for doing good things. That's why I've been so intrigued about a book that I heard of recently. It's a book about the great cathedrals of Europe. Now, hang with me. There's a connection here, so don't let me lose you. How many of you have been to Europe? How many of you perhaps have visited some of the great cathedrals? Now, you may know, there were people that spent not just decades, lifetimes working on these cathedrals. In fact, some of them took well over 100 years to complete. They're magnificent structures. They are wonderful testimonies to the workmanship, the craftsmanship of the people that worked on them, and also their faith, and they could never be duplicated again, not in this day and age. And the really interesting fact that I found in this book was this. We can't name the people that built most of these cathedrals in Europe. The builders are unknown. They gave their all, some of the people gave their very lives, their whole careers to building these things, knowing that they would never get a pat on the back. They would never get any sort of credit for what they had done. In fact, let me tell you a specific story. There was a, a workman, uh, this was in London, that was working on one of the cathedrals there. He was a stonemason, 
and he was carving stone at about 30 to 40 feet up in the air. He was very meticulous about his job. And after about a month of working up there, somebody asked him, why would you put so much time and effort into something that no human eye will ever see? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? Why would you put a lot of work and blood, sweat, and tears into something that no human eye would ever see? You know what his response was? But God sees it. God sees it. And you see, what I'm telling you today is these invisible people that worked at these cathedrals trusted that God saw all of their efforts. They gave their whole lives and their very best almost as an act of worship to God. And they made personal sacrifices, even though they were never going to get any credit or any fanfare. They just knew they were doing the right thing. They just knew they were building something greater than themselves that would live far, far beyond their lifetimes. It would live on for generations and even centuries. And get this, and this is kind of the crux of my point today here. The author of this book concluded by saying, no great cathedrals will ever again be built in this world. Once again, not because they'd be so costly to duplicate, but no great cathedrals will ever again be built because today, no one's willing to sacrifice the way that people sacrificed in those days. Now think with me, what do you think about that? Is this author right? Is he onto something? Are we people that are willing to sacrifice today to serve even when nobody knows what we're doing, nobody sees what we're doing? Are we willing to be invisible in order for the greater good? Think about that. Friends, on this All Saints weekend, let me remind you, we are all building something with our lives, whether you realize it or not. Every day you get up, no, no matter how menial your tasks are, each and every day, you are building what you, you might say something greater than a cathedral. You and I are building something that will go on beyond the decades, beyond the centuries, even beyond the millennium. You and I are building something for eternity. And there may be days in your life and mine when we may feel invisible. Like nobody sees what we're doing. Nobody knows. In fact, nobody cares. But what I want to say to you is this. This is my main point for the day. This is a very personal God that we serve, that's made us and created us and put us here. And this personal God says to you, I see everything you do. You're not invisible to me. It says, I see your efforts, and I applaud them. I appreciate them. God says, I see you get the kids up every morning, feed them, get them off to school. He said, nothing goes unseen by me. He said, I see you when you stop over your neighbor's house, that elderly person that can't do yard work anymore, and you step in and mow the lawn and rake the leaves. God says, I see that. God says, I see you faithfully helping around the church or the school, giving your very best, making this community a better place. God says, you're not invisible to me. God says, I see you praying for that old friend that you haven't seen in decades, that lives on another state, but the way you faithfully lift them up day after day. God says, I see that. And I see the little things that you do for your husband and for your wife and for your parents even though they don't recognize what you're doing. God says, you are not invisible. I see it all. There's a story of two churches that existed side by side. I get this. True story, by the way. But I'm going to change their names. They were on the same walk. One was called First Methodist Church. One was called First Memorial Church. Now, part of it was because of their name and part of it was because of their proximity, but they were often confused one for the other. And so these churches became very competitive as the years went by. They were always trying to outdo each other, whether it was on the softball field with the church softball league or whether it was counting the heads of who had more people in worship each week. But well, one Sunday afternoon, the youth group at First Methodist Church got together. The youth leader challenged the kids. He said, I want you to go out today. I want you to get out of the church. I want you to go out into the neighborhood. And I want you to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. I want you to be like Jesus. Can you do that? Can you make a difference? And they said, yeah, we can do that. And so off they went. They, they split up in smaller groups and they fanned out. And 
sun went out and they, uh, they, they were washing cars in the neighborhood, calling motorists in, and washing the car up, giving it their very best, and not charging a cent. Other kids went out and they were doing yard work for people around the community that uh, didn't even ask for the help, but they were people that they knew couldn't do it for themselves. Others went down to the nursing home and they sang and uh, did a little entertainment for the people there. And then when the day was done, they all came back to First Methodist Church and they all shared how they'd spent their time, how they'd spent their day. One group that had been, uh, that had been out doing yard work said, well, we went to a little old lady's house who lived right next to First Memorial Church. And we mowed her lawn and we cleaned it up really nice. And uh, then she called us in. And she thanked us for doing that. She prayed for us. And then she said, now listen to this. She said, you kids from First Memorial Church, you're always doing such nice things for us in the neighborhood. Now, what church were they from? <laughs> First Methodist Church. And the youth leader had a fit. He said, she thought you were from First Memorial. I hope you said it straight. I hope you told her you were from First Methodist. And the kids said, no, no, we didn't do that. You see, you told us to do what Jesus did. We thought that Jesus would have kept his mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to me the point of the story is this. We don't need to be concerned about who gets credit for things. First Memorial, First Methodist, Bethel Lutheran Church, as long as God is glorified by our efforts. In other words, the object of our lives is not to make ourselves look good, but to direct people's attention to, to God. Do you believe that? Do we live that way? That's why I'm struck by today's gospel lesson that you heard me read. Once again, these were the words of John the Baptist. Now, you know, in the New Testament, John the Baptist was a major figure. He was a key player. He could have had quite an ego. He could have had a big head about himself. And yet, you heard the words when he was reflecting on Jesus, the true star of the show. Jesus, or excuse me, John's heartfelt words were, I must what? I must decrease so that he can increase. And once again, I say, remember those words. I must decrease so that he can increase. In other words, I, I can be invisible so Jesus can be more visible in the world. Now let me ask you this morning, how often do you hear that thought come through loud and clear in the world that we live in today? How often do you see people allowing other people to get the glory? get the credit for things. How often do you see other people saying, Jesus is the one that we need to be lifting up? Is this the kind of humility that we set for a goal as disciples of Jesus? Or are you and I those people that always need to be on the marquee, getting top billing, getting the fanfare? It's been said, there is no limit to what a church can do if nobody cares who gets the credit. Think about those words, if you will. There's no limit to what a church can do if nobody cares who gets the credit. And as I said before, I want to challenge you this week with something, not just the kids. What would it be like if you and I were to go out from this place today and do something for someone that, number one, they could never repay? There's no way they could ever give back what you give given them. And number two, if you did it, secretly, invisibly. But they didn't even know that you were the one that did it for them. What would that be like? I'm asking you to go today, and you might say, to build a cathedral that will live long after you, a cathedral that really draws attention to God and not to you and me. You know, we live in a day and age of selfishness. Would anybody, would anybody deny that? But what I'm asking is today that we would be selfless people. You know, the antidote, the antidote to selfishness is selflessness. It was uh, last Sunday, we had somewhere between seven or 800 people at Bethel Lutheran Church over the four services. Could you imagine if seven or 800 people went out this week and did quiet, secret acts of kindness for people that would never know who was, who was doing this for? Can you imagine what sort of difference that could make in your neighborhood, or the school, or the church, or this community, or the state, <clears throat> or even this world. And remember, we don't go to do it because it makes us feel good. We're not doing it because we're going to get recognition. 
In fact, I would even say, yeah, we do it for other people, but even more so, we do it for God. We do it as a testimony of our faith for this great God that we love and serve. And so that's my challenge to you today. And it's going to be very difficult next week to show up and say, hey, how did you do? Because you can't say anything. You've got to be quiet about it, right? But I hope you'll take up this challenge. Let's end with these words of John the Baptist. I'll say it and you say it. I must decrease so that he can increase. Do you believe it? Can we live that way? Let's pray. Oh Lord, you call us to a very different path in life. You call us away from selfishness towards selflessness. And so on this week, as the people of Bethlehem Lutheran Church, help us to follow in your footsteps. Help us to live our lives in discipleship in a way that glorifies you and not ourselves. These things we ask and pray and believe. And all the people of God together this morning say, Amen.